I'm Marshall Kosloff. I am the co-host of the Realignment Podcast. And this is basically going to be a live podcast episode that I'm recording with Jay and Lucas. Really interesting conversation. Uh, I want to introduce the two of them real quick, though. Jay is the founder and general partner of Countdown Capital, and Lucas is an investor at Village Global, but I think most importantly for this conversation, he is the co-host of Solar Punk, which is legitimately one of the best podcasts in the tech and venture space. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely one of those podcasts where I started listening to it for work, but I actually just kept on doing it, because it's just like that legitimate and awesome. So if you're interested in these topics, I really recommend you check out what he and his co-host Ian are up to. So. Let's just start very basically, starting with you, Jay. What would you say is the problem with American industry right now? Well, the problem can be summarized as we've offshored trillions of dollars over the last three or four decades um, you know, to Asia and Latin America, countries like China, Malaysia, um, and we have lost the soul of building. Um, you know, we've offshored probably somewhere between one and two trillion dollars, if not more, um, and we also have an impending talent shortage. You know, over the next eight or nine years, if we don't fill over one million manufacturing jobs, we're looking at a uh, opportunity cost of $1 trillion. So on one hand, we've offshored a ton of our traditional industry uh, to other countries, frankly, some of which are adversarial. Um, and second, we have a domestic problem. We have a talent shortage. And so those are the two big problems that I see uh, with American industry today. Just a quick follow-up. When you say uh, domestic talent shortage, is this like a learn-to-code joke? Like, what's the gap there? Like, what's the issue? Well, it depends on how you look at the way American industry should be built over the next 10 years. Um, you know, if we continue to go on this path where uh, we want everything to be done by hand and we want traditional labor to be a part of uh, how we build manufacturing companies, for example, um, then the kind of talent needs to come from blue-collar towns and we need to really invest in reskilling people um, to be technicians and to be engineers on the ground. However, if traditional industry is going to be one of which uh, software and hardware and, and technology is a big part of, then we need a blend of different people. We need software engineers, people that are coming from places like Stripe, Apple, et cetera. We need hardware engineers, folks that are spending time at SpaceX. And then we need your traditional blue collar workers. So it's, it really depends on how you look at building American industry over the next 10 years. I'm uh, very clearly aligned with the latter, and I'm investing the latter, um, but it's an open question at the moment. Well, the, 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 the only thing I was gonna add to that is that on top of all the things that Jay said, we broke the back of the middle class, right? So um, I think one of the biggest issues that we actually have in the United States right now is the sort of um, uh, massive, um, Issue, the, the, the massive economic gap that we've created between the, the richest and the poorest, it, which, which is so funny to me because when we, I grew up in Brazil and I always thought that Brazil was so, a socialist country when I, when I grew up. And I, I heard the word in, inequality and all my, my alarm just you know, raised and I was like, oh, that's a commie. Uh, but, but, but in reality, I actually think that you know, because of the fact that we outsource so many of the jobs, we have this future, we have this reality in which the richest become software engineers, they become founders, um, and, and, and the rest is being filled by immigrant workers um, and, and not by the sort of blue collar workers that represented the middle class in the United States like 50, 70 years ago. I think it's funny, whenever we have this conversation, very quickly it transitions from a conversation about like tech and venture investment to how do you really feel in America right now? You had a really interesting episode of Ross Douthat where he's obviously talking about his most recent recent, no, not his most recent book, but like his second to last book, um, which is called The Decadent Society. Um, I would love for you both to give like, what narrative would you understand America through? You could say, hey, we're in Tyler Cowen's great stagnation. Peter Thiel's, you know, we were promised flying cars, we got 120, you know, 140 characters. That's a different narrative. Like, what are your, bo what are your versions uh, that you two are thinking through? Well, I, I, I generally agree with Ross, uh, you know, ultimately, tech in the way that it was represented back on JFK and the idea that we choose to go to the moon was that you can actually build those really hard things uh, and, and have the audacity to pursue the frontier. Um, and somehow we've lost that. We've lost the idea of the frontier over the last few decades. I think we're slowly coming back to that. You know, I think companies like SpaceX, 
uh, have really pushed pu push the, the barrier of what that could represent. And we're seeing a new generation of founders with the companies like Varda, Hadrian, and all these other companies that Jay and I uh, are looking, hope, hoping to invest in. Um, but it, for whatever reason, and we, we can discuss this at length, uh, that's the topic of a whole book, um, we, we're, we have not been able to pursue the same types of technologies uh, in the way that we thought was possible uh, decades ago. So you, you watch, for example, uh, all, all the space movies, the science fiction movies that were written in the 60s, in, in, in the 70s, and people thought they were gonna have you know, cities in the moon, cities on Mars, like, and for whatever reason, that future did not come to pan out. Now, I, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to say that you know, there have not been great companies built over the last few decades. Obviously, that's not true. But the idea of the future that we thought could be possible have, has, has not worked out like we thought, like it, we thought it was. Yeah, I, I would agree uh, very largely with what you just described. The only thing I would add is that um, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, because of financialization, because uh, you know, most traditional companies have per pursued margin expansion um, in different countries, uh, we don't have the financial incentives we've, in the last three or four decades to really build hard things. And I think for the first time in human history, uh, at least in, in most recent human history, it feels like technology is converging to a point where it can actually do some real damage um, in industries that aren't just B2B SaaS, for example. And so I largely agree with everything Lucas said, but the only thing I would, I would also add is that the financial pressures are, are increasing to bring things back home, to use more technology, the adoption's there, and I think that's the, the really unique time, the really unique thing about the time we're living in at the moment. Yeah, if I can add just one thing to that, because that is a fantastic point. Um, if this has come up multiple times on the podcast, actually, there's this amazing website called uh, W2F happened in 1971. Uh, and you actually, like, if you look through that website uh, and, and you do look at the research behind it, you know, the, the moment that we left out the gold standard, the moment that we actually started the, the financialization of our economy, um, that's, you know, that's why Wall Street started making all more money. All these companies started just focusing on fin financializing their products. Um, and, and we shifted away from the culture of builders to the culture of, you know, making money on the stock market. Um, not to say that this was not true at all before, but the, the conversion towards financialization that we've been in since the 70s has not stopped, perhaps until now. Something I'd love to get into to actually talk about your day jobs. Um, Jay, when you and I were, were talking about this on Tuesday, you brought up this really interesting point. When you're, when you're speaking to founders and prospective founders, you've noticed there's this kind of bifurcation where you'll have folks describe, hey, here's this problem. Problem, the US can't manufacture things, or we need to go into space, or insert, like, think of like A16Z's American Dynamism thesis yeah. to like the broad industrial spaces and defense tech you're investing in. That's one category, there are plenty of companies there. Yep. But then you oftentimes have folks describe problems which hypothetically a company could solve, but actually there's like a broader policy that needs to be addressed there. Like how do you think through those two different categories? So this is a very, very long discussion. I think the first um, main point is capital efficiency, right? If you cannot generate revenue in excess of what you need to raise in order to build a company, I would say that's a capital inefficient company. Um, it's probably not a good investment. Um, and most likely there's a policy problem that needs to be solved. So semiconductors are a really good example. We need more semiconductor manufacturing here in the United States, um, but we're not gonna solve it by simply asking founders to go build a semiconductor company. We need a lot more uh, depth in terms of the policy that's being uh, spread towards smaller companies going after these areas than just giving a big subsidy to Intel to go do it. So um, the way I look at it is um, it's, it's all about capital, capital efficiency. As an investor, I'm not gonna invest in a capital inefficient problem, but I obviously want to see policy that's going to be changed and that's why I'm here, right? Um, if, if there's one thing I would add to that, um, Antonio Garcia Martinez, who's here, um, actually made a great point a couple months ago, which is we, we kind of evolved into a society in which the most ambitious, ambitious people all want to start companies. Um, that's a great thing if you're a venture capitalist. <laughs> it's been a great few decades, decades to, to be a VC. But you know, the reality is that we need more than just great founders. We need great politicians. We, great, we need great people who are interest, interested in building institutions, uh, working in all different sorts of things. Um, 
And because of you know, this mindset that, that we've been in and this economy that we've built, uh, we actually don't have the smartest people wanting to, wanting to build um, you know, great, uh, great schools or you know, great, great policy and, and all of these things. Um, like I said, it's amazing if you're a venture capitalist, but I, I, I actually do think that if, if we want to build the best society possible, we don't want all the smartest people to just pursue great companies because not every single problem can be solved necessarily by a company. Another question that uh, comes to mind when you put things that way, like to what degree could the tech industry actually like address that? So for example, think of the robber barons. The robber barons subsidized all sorts of ideas, concepts, literal institutions that like express their values. Is hyper successful Lucas Bagno 20 years from now, are you like, giving money to like weird cults who could maybe have build, building based religions. Like how, how do you think about how tech and like the fact that finance and money and like the generative effects there have gone, how, how could tech play a role in that ecosystem? Yeah, well, I, I, the, the narrative uh, for the last 20 years has certainly been, you know, software will eat the world and you know, tech will eat everything. Largely that has been true to some degree. Um, but I also think it's a very convenient narrative if you're a VC, <laughs> that, yes. that's, that's the story you want to tell. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure uh, that everything can be solved through tech. Uh, you know, if anything, I think that looking at where we are right now, and so even some of the discussions that happened today, um, you know, I, I actually think we need a rejuvenation, uh, a renaissance of the values that built this country in the first place. That was not built through tech. Um, we need policy, enlightened policy. We need, you know, to reaffirm a lot of values uh, of the culture that built this country. Um, I don't think the answer of that is tech. Um, if I'm being honest, I think that there is a large portion of the population uh, in the tech ecosystem that all of us here are part of that see the solution as, for everything as being tech as largely a cope uh, to not actually deal with, with some of the nastiest problems that we have. Only thing I would add to that is that I, th I think in general we need more people like Peter Thiel. Um, we need folks that have made money in tech that are willing to inspire people, people like Blake Masters to go out and to go run a campaign and to go try to do something for our country. That is what we need. Um, frankly, I think um, you know, we in tech are in a bubble 99% of the time, only thinking about the products that need to be built. But in reality, the things that move the needle for most people is policy and campaigning. Um, and we just need more and more money, more and more minds from tech that are thinking about those kinds of things. Yeah, I I'm just laughing because um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And it's funny because it is really not the narrative that we're incentivized to tell as VCs. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I largely think it's true. Yeah. So to your point, Lucas, about you know, software eating the world, like Mark Andreessen's big essay um, is like a perfect explainer of what happens from you know, 2008 to basically pre-COVID 2020. There are plenty of things that software obviously didn't eat, but I think part, part, part of the reason why you're launching funds why Village Global is doing what it's doing and why you have a solar product podcast is there is some sort of opportunity that makes this different than the 1990s. Because in many ways, we could have a version of this conversation, maybe if we were a little more prescient, but we could have said, oh, hey, like, hmm, maybe globalization won't go so well. It's bad that we have American industry basically fleeing, but I think it's easy to understand that there would be technological gaps that wouldn't be able to be filled in 93. So like, what is changing now? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I have to say a couple of things. You mentioned globalization. Um, one could argue that we're actually going to go through a period of deglobalization uh, that's going to happen soon. Like, there's an amazing book, uh, Peter Zehan, uh, The End of the World is Just Beginning, uh, where he talks about you know, the process of decoupling with China and you know, largely what deglobalization could look like. The reality is it's not pretty. Uh, the reality is it's going to be very painful to a lot of us. Uh, that being said, there will also be opportunity. Uh, and you know, if, if you want to make money on those changes, I actually think that you know the, the thesis that Jay have a lot of what we've been investing in Village, although we, we invest largely across different sectors. But this idea of investing in American infrastructure, uh, in, in core uh, infrastructure capabilities that America is going to need in, in that new future, uh, will generate a lot of uh, a lot of potential returns. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the opportunity for me at least comes down to three things versus the 1990s. Um, the first is talent. We talked about that earlier. There are more software engineers than ever before, more hardware engineers than ever before. And so they want to go and start companies. That was not there in the 1990s. Um, the second is specifically that there's a playbook for success. Um, 
you look at companies like SpaceX, companies like Anduril, for example, they've had a very, very long and hard path, but because of their work, they've been able to, to you know, pave the path for some new companies to come into the fray. And uh, at least that's what I believe we both are, are betting on, is that more companies will fall in their, in their footsteps. The third is specifically around software and the maturity of software. I think a lot of hard tech companies are traditionally looked at as hardware, um, but the best hard tech companies, companies like Hadrian, um, will be looking to sassify their business models uh, and also bring in um, you know, software to help streamline some of their operations. And that has a major uh, uh, potential to increase margins from say 10% to like 20 or 25%, um, which will keep them quite competitive with the rest of the world. And so I think it really comes down to these three things. Um, sure, uh, geopolitical tailwinds are there. The US government is putting a lot of money into bringing things back home. But the, the core argument comes down to these three things, and it has to be financially motivated. Otherwise, we will not, we will be in the same situation that we were 40 years ago, in my opinion. You know, I'm curious, Lucas, um, you're talking about deglobalization, de making money, opportunities in this space. I'm curious how you think a world that's becoming a little more zero sum, how does tech broadly think about that like at a conceptual level? Because if I think of what makes tech cool to me as a person who like, came up in DC, it was, hey, like it's not purely about like this person for this person for this election. It's, hey, like if we create more money, we found more companies, you found more companies, there's more money, this, this, or that. A deglobalizing world is a world where you can't just go be a remote worker in whatever country you want and things are chill. So like how do you think that reality is gonna affect tech and the way tech conceives of itself? It's a, it's a great point. Uh, you know, what, one thing I would say is uh, I'm generally pessimist on the macro uh, and optimistic on, on the micro uh, because I do think that for better or worse, worse the, the world is going to become a lot more zero sum than it has been for the last few decades. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I have pre pretty deep conviction at this point that this is the future that we're headed and I could very well be wrong. Uh, now, to your question, how to make money out of this, <laughs> how will tech play a role in this? Um, there are many different ways to be a successful inventor. I personally am of the belief uh, that we, you, you back the best founders, and, and that, that's the only thing that I really care about, and I think Jay and I yes. may have a different way uh, of looking at things, maybe. Uh, but for me, uh, it, it really comes down to when you meet those people, um, is this really a top 0.1% individual? And one of the things that, you know, this is why I think I, I'm optimistic on the micro, because of what Jay said, we have actually had more exceptional people starting companies than ever before. That, that is, you know, that will probably be one of the things that will keep America leading the world, uh, is the fact that we still continue to develop and attract the, the top 0.1% talent that actually want and have the ambition to start the biggest companies in the world. Yeah, I, I would also add, like, there's been a realization in, in venture capital of late that the kinds of founders that you need for these companies are fundamentally different than say the Zuckerbergs of the world, right? The founders that you need for these kinds of companies as, as we've been learning over the last 10 years uh, need to be able to wage political battles. They need to build armies of talent. Uh, they need to be able to schmooze, but they also need to be able to brute force uh, towards certain goals. And so if Zuckerberg was the pinnacle of the software era, Elon is, the, I would say, the early example of what goes right in the hard tech era. And we need more founders who are willing to brute force, but also have a bit a uh, bit of an ability to schmooze as well. Um, that's very different than anything we've seen before, I think. Well, in VC. Although Zuckerberg is building hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I think the next question would be, what do you see, actually, when we speak to another tension that relates to the deglobalization thing. I was uh, at an event um, in Miami earlier this week and I was talking to this person who was convinced, convinced that America is gonna break up, you're gonna have you know, Bitcoin drive the Fed to basically do all those Bitcoiny things. The tension here is, if you believe everything that you are articulating with deglobalization, nation states matter, identity, tribalism matters, it seems like the idea of these decentralizing forces breaking things apart are actually gonna hit some sort of hard limit. That'd be my take about it. I'm curious no, no, how you two I, think about this. I 100% agree with you. Uh, you know, uh, We're saying that too much, but so uh, let's fight <laughs> just, more. Just because I, I mentioned before, uh, uh, Antonio has a great essay just uh, called, uh, you know, who would take a bullet for the Dow? Right, like uh, I think at the end of the day, like we're not headed for a world of the network state. I have not been convinced of, it, of that yet. That would be very cool if it happened. Uh, I actually do think that we're still headed to a world where nation states matter. If anything, they will matter even more than they have for the last few decades. 
Um, now, although I sounded pessimistic uh, in saying about the future, and I, I do think that we're headed to, to, world, to a world in which is more zero sum, if there is one thing that is uh, you know, pretty true now that we're nearing the end of 2022, is that it, America is actually in a better position than a lot of people think. Uh, it, China has had a horrible year. Russia has had a, a, you know, an even worse year. Um, so we, even though America has a lot of challenges, all of our adversaries are in a much worse position than us. I think India could be the wild card, uh, but ultimately this has been net-net a decent uh, year for America relative to its competitors. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just build on that and say, look, the, the world of Fukuyama is a mirage, right? Um, real politics never went anywhere. We just were blind to it in a lot of different ways. Um, and we, you know, we certainly set, uh, you know, told ourselves a narrative that we want to believe for, I think, couple of decades that people, you know, countries were not trying to innovate and try to beat the United States. Reality is that they are. Um, and so as I, as I look at, you know, nation states becoming more important, I definitely agree with Lucas. It's going to be 100% uh, a fixture of, I think, the modern world, at least today and, and going forward over the next decade. Um, and that's a feature, not a bug. I think more competition between countries is a net good thing because it, it encourages, encourages us to innovate as a people, to, to find some soul in our society. Um, and to you know to find things to work on together, you know. So I think it's a good thing. Um, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing at all. Yeah, if I could take issue just with one thing that you said, is I, I actually think that this has been the year of Fukuyama. Uh, you know, I think that at the end of the day, like when we're nearing the end of this year, the one thing that has become pretty evident is that we actually have no alternative to liberal democracy uh, in the way that it works. Like China is, you know, nearing a, 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 a generational collapse. Uh, the economy is in shambles. Uh, they have, you know, an autocratic leader that is, you know, showing himself to be more and more incompetent. Uh, and on the other side, we have Russia proposing this alternative view of the world that, you know, it's clearly, it's clearly not, not very competent at what it does. The, I think the challenge that we have is actually uh, we have not created anything that is an alternative to liberal democracy, yeah. uh, which is Fukuyama's point. Uh, but also, if you look within the United States, you know, we have the debate about California and Florida. Uh, you just look at what's happening in some of the richest states in this country, uh, and it's just absolutely horrifying. <laughs> so yeah. so I, I'm not sure, like, th I think to me that is the question of the decade. You know, something I appreciate about um, founders and VCs in your space is that, I don't want to say it's that you're like staying in your lane, but it's just that you recognize the limits of what tech and industry can do. So it's not purely like, hey, like, we're going to launch a bunch of startups and the world will be saved. When you're talking about, you know, a, a stagnating society, when you're talking about the middle class, like there's obviously something that's going to require bigger policy and political changes than anything successful. Like you guys could achieve every single one of your venture related goals and there will still be a degree of problem there that policymakers, DC folks and this audience are going to have to really deal with. So like what would be the areas, solutions, issues of focus that you would focus on given what you said at the start of this? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Areas for yeah, founders? Basically, yeah, basically like for the areas outside of just like tech and venture specifically, you're talking about the issue in American society is like inequality. Like what broad societal changes, recommendations, like policies, or even areas of focus would you recommend DC-based folks think about in terms of people filling their roles properly? Oh man, um, there are so many things we could talk about here. Um, I think a couple uh, just that come to mind, you know, uh, like people are not have, having children. Uh, you know, people don't celebrate families anymore. Uh, you know, even kids, like what, what people are teaching on kids at schools, not in Florida, but, but elsewhere in the country is, is absolutely staggering. Uh, so I think if you just uh, look at, uh, you know, education, family, uh, and then a couple of these industries that actually need regulatory and policy uh, uh, achievements to actually s succeed, uh, there's a, there's a lot of work to do. Like, we, th this could be the discussion until the end of the event today. <laughs> yeah. Main framing I have is delegate more to state and local governments. Um, I think, if, you know, Mayor Francis Suarez is actually a great example. Like, it's just him asking how he can help he attracted numerous VCs and other people in tech to the city. Um, state and local governments usually have their ear close to the ground. They understand who are the real innovators. They're not just focused purely on just who the intels of the world are. They're more interested in who, who can move the needle, who can do something that's gonna be 100x change for their town or their state. And so I think we should delegate more, generally speaking, and incentivize states and local governments to create more local funds or state funds to invest in innovation. I think a lot of that is too conveniently 
you know, held in the federal government and discussed over closed doors. That's, yeah. that's my opinion. If I could add just one thing to that, I think it was Catherine Boyd that said on, on the podcast that we had with her, um, you know, the, the hope for, for America, the optimistic future for America is an America that has much more federalism than it has had for the last couple of decades. Um, so, you know, if you're in the Bitcoin circles, if you're in the, the, the crypto circles, you hear, you hear a lot about exit, right? Like you need to exit, like Balaji had that, had that talk like 10 years ago, talking about uh, how tech needs to exit society in some ways. Um, I, I think the exit that needs to happen is actually to different states. Uh, and, you know, bring back America in the way it was conceived to have, you know, people actually living uh, uh, around the people that, that they agree with, around the people that, that they share uh, a common set of beliefs with. Uh, and you know, we, we had here the, the California and, and Florida debate, and like, you put those people together in a room, and, and like, they could not be more different. Um, so the, the optimistic future for America is, is really one where we actually have the different set of choices and people really vote with their feet um, so that we can decide what kind of country does the United States actually want to be. I think the question then becomes, and I think there's an answer to this, it's just not quite clear to me, the, the response to folks who thinks the country will disintegrate in the forces of, you know, in the face of decentralization and monetary policy, federalism, like what is it that you two think holds America together even as that 30, 40, 50 year like model changes? It's a good question. I think what holds America together, America together is the same thing that has held America together since 1776, right? Like the, 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 the believing in the same principles that that were founded, uh, that, that, that were you know that people believed in uh, in the founding of this country that are still written in the Constitution today. Um, this country is very resilient, uh, you, you know. So uh, I, I think it has not torn itself apart before. I, I don't think it will turn itself apart again, just because people actually choose to reject some of the dystopia that is happening in some of the cities and some of the states in this country. Yeah, I mean, I really don't have much to add. The only thing I would add, I guess, in terms of the personality of Americans and what Americans aspire for, aspire for I think, generally unites us. I mean, that's first, hope, you know, hope for the future. We never stop hoping. Second, we always want a better future for our kids. The ambition isn't ever lost um, in this country, which is amazing. Um, and the third is that we're rude, we're brash. We want to make our point, um, and you know, we're not like Europeans. We're, we're ready to work hard to make our point. And so those three things, to me, really stand out as unifying factors for us. Something I'm curious about, um, Jake, as we talked about this, um, let's get to more like the theory of investing in these spaces. Like you're, you're very convicted around the need to come in at the earliest stages of these companies. We'd love to like get an articulation of like your thesis at a mechanical level, and then obviously the same question to you too, Lucas. Sure. So um, my thesis at a mechanical level is that uh, most of these hard tech companies at the earliest stages um, are basically in a valley of death until they prove out their market, prove out their customers, and recruit enough talent to, to convince a larger firm to invest in the company. And so uh, generally speaking, what Countdown Capital does, I think, pretty well so far is pick founders at the earliest stages that have the potential, given a small amount of capital, to do some big things, like recruit great, team, great one or two people onto their team, um, get one or two big customers or, or relatively sizable customers on their balance sheet, um, uh, sorry, on their, on their book. Um, and the third is, you know, very specifically to put out an ambitious plan that makes sense, that actually makes financial sense um, that a larger investor will underwrite, you know? And so my, my, uh, my goal and also my role at this early stage is to challenge founders to really think through their business plan and to help them uh, come to a place where their business plan is not only ambitious that it'll solve a big problem, but also makes sense, like there's a broad capital allocation base that they can draw into that will convince a larger investor that they should invest in a heavily capital intensive company, you know? So so my, uh, my role is really to challenge, is to give them that first belief capital, that first dollar that believes in them, then uh, challenges them from day one to, to go after a, a bigger and also more thoughtful mission. Yeah, um, I, I will push back on the question a little bit in the sense that I, I we, uh, personally, I actually don't have a thesis, and I, and I, you know, th like I said, there are many different ways to be successful in venture. Uh, the way that I think works for me is just, you know, trying to answer the question like, is this really a top tier founder? Now, I'm willing to invest in any space. I'm willing to invest in, you know, I, I actually subscribe to the theology that startups are not companies, uh, and a startup is an idea that could eventually become a company one day. Uh, and you know, I actually think that when you get into the depth of it, uh, you are actually looking for a lot of the things that Jay said. Uh, which is, you know, does this, this founder really understand like the, the nuances, the depth uh, that goes into these things? And you know, when you actually meet the, the very best founders, they, they actually have thought 
through, they have thought through every single nook and cranny uh, that, 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 uh, of the business and of the risks and of the opportunities. Um, I think it's a, it's a similar way to get the same answer, yeah. um, but it's a, it's a slightly different perspective. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is just that it's important to remember because of how capital intensive these companies are, they usually need 20 million, 30 million to get to market, right, just to get started. Um, and if you're trying to raise 20 million or 30 million right off the bat, it's extremely difficult. Um, you have a major coal start problem. And so by taking on money from people like me and Lucas at the early stages, um, you start to gain momentum in your ability to fundraise and your ability to navigate conversations. That's really important. Um, you, it's very unlikely for anybody, even if they're a top 0.1% founder, to be able to go raise a $20 million round right off the bat. Uh, the, the, the one thing that Jay said here a couple of minutes ago that, that I agree is, especially in those sectors uh, where you're building, you know, stuff in the real world that are very capital intensive, you do need a different breed of founder. Uh, and they, they're different in several ways. Uh, and, and just the complexity of building those companies is 100x harder uh, of building some of the, you know, different uh, capital-like companies. A question that comes to mind, given your point about building in the real world. I was thinking about this during the Web3 conversations we had earlier. Um, insert like metaverse reference to like, wh what is it like to be thinking about these spaces during a time that there is just a lot of energy, like bear market or not, in like Web3, in these like digital centric things here, you know? What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, you and I were having that conversation last night, uh, and it's funny because uh, so Jay and I have a have a, a good friend that actually posted on Twitter a couple weeks ago, uh, like, oh, like the the you know uh, hard tech and American dynamism are the new gold rush in venture capital, um, and I didn't say it, but the, the thought I had was like, I hope that's not true, or yeah. if, if if it is, then it's actually very bearish, <laughs> uh, b because. The only way I think to really make money in venture big time, and you know, there was a, a few nuances that we can get into why that's not always the case, but you know, the way to make money in venture is to actually invest in things before they get hot. <laughs> and, and once they're hot, and once they're you know, on everybody's mind, like Web3 was uh, until the beginning of this year, then it's actually really hard to make money because you know, most of the returns have been arbitraged away, the prices have gone up, so you know, the asset that you're paying, you're paying 100, you know, 100x the price. So um, yeah, ultimately I, I, I hope that we're not in a, in a sector of uh, at a point in which uh, investing in hard tech is the thing that everybody's looking for, because if, if it is, it means that <laughs> Jay's and I's returns are getting deeply compressed. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll build off that. I mean, I actually think there's some research out there that suggests that VCs do do well in bubbles, um, because there is, uh, you know, there are lots of valuation uh, expansion that happens during these kinds of periods. Um, at the same time, who loses are founders, because founders think that these problems are easy in a bull market, in a, in a bubble and they start to raise money and they think that things are going well and then money just shuts off when a bubble pops, right? And then you have maybe 20 or 30 companies that thought they were gonna do something great for this country that are just immediately cut off from any kind of funding. And so that to me is the real risk. Uh, I think as VCs, our returns have always followed a power law kind of scenario and so the best companies are always gonna help us. Um, it's the companies that are in the middle that thought they were going to be the best that are hurt during a bubble. Yeah, if I can add just one thing to that, um, part of what's so hard of investing in, in these hot sectors as well is that as these sectors, you know, blow up and become, you know, the first thing on everybody's mind, the, the quality of founders that, that it attracts just the case. So if, if you just assume that, you know, let's say there's uh, out of every sector, there's 5% of founders that are top tier, likely a lot less than that, but 95% of founders that are, you know, not the best, and you're looking for the 5%. As these sectors blow up, uh, the, the quality of good founders grow linearly at best, log logarithmically at worst, while the, the quality of you know, not so great founders just grows exponentially because everybody just wants to jump in. Yeah. That just makes your problem as a VC so much harder <laughs> to, to, to actually find the needle in the haystack. Um, and that's another one of the reasons why, for example, like, I actually have not invested that much in Web3 over the last, over the last two years. Like I have, I've given one offer and one other term sheet. Um, and I, I have not found it to be the best place to invest, just given how many people it attracts. One last thing that I, I would say, the slight pushback would be, if you know the space as well, um, it's actually advantageous to you to be able to filter through a lot of noise because you're able to pick the needle in the haystack that nobody else is seeing. And so that's the, the counter to that, but at the same time, I, I agree, there are, there are gonna be lots of false positives in, in this kind of space. So for the uh, last question before we get to Q&A, I wonder what the two of you, how would the two of you sum up basically the past two years since 
to bring back the you know, software is eating the world idea, since Mark Andreessen writes, it's time to build, and I think like April, May of 2020, like really like introduces this narrative, obviously lays down the like narrative stakes, which as we know, like drives a lot of these decisions. Like what, have, what, like, what happened in these spaces over the past two years? And then what lessons can we pick up from them separately from, you know, the conversation of like, you know, SpaceX building over the past like, you know, decade plus. Um, I, I can go first. Well, the first thing I'll say, like I've made my first investment about five years ago, so it's not like I've, <laughs> you know, been in the industry for that many decades. Uh, the last couple of years have been, you know, absolute madness. Uh, I think since since the beginning of COVID, um, there are certainly reasons to be optimistic. Uh, I think that, you know, there are founders that we're seeing that take themselves, they 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 are much more serious uh, about the problems of the world, about you know, the audacity of what they want to solve and their ambition. Um, I, I do think it's too early to tell. Uh, of you know, if we're really headed to a world where we're actually going to build these really hard companies, and we have you know develop a different type of, a type of founder, uh, there are early good signs, positive signs, but largely too early to tell. Yeah, this is a tough question because I would say that over the next eight years, things are going to look very different than the last couple of years. Um, we're entering a, a very interesting period where interest rates are much higher, um, cost of capital is much much higher. That's going to be, a, a, you know, very, very deflationary force on a lot of, you know, risk assets, um, and so I think it's going to be a very, very, very different world going forward. Um, but the way I would talk about the last couple of years, and I actually wrote about this in my LPs recently, was the great dislocation. It's the way I like to talk about it. And so dislocation in terms of how we look at trade interests and political interests internationally between the United States and China, between the U.S. and Russia, you know, fissures that have made themselves very clear. That's number one. Number two, dislocation in terms of how companies look about uh, look at architecting their supply chains. You know, just-in-time logistics is likely not going to work anymore. It's all about having a diversified supply base, um, and that's completely changed the way companies are going to be doing business this decade, uh, especially physical businesses. And the fi final thing I will say is that I think over the last couple of years, with COVID, obviously domestically, we've seen a lot of public health issues and other types of issues become political issues, um, and science has become very political. And so um, I would say that uh, the dislocation between what's in public interest and what's in my interest uh, has become very clear. Excellent place to leave it. Guys, thank you so much for uh, joining us.